Hi, I'm Dr. Tracy Prince. I'm with Portland State University's Department of Curriculum and Instruction. I'm a research professor, which means that I work only on uh, researching and writing books and um, working hard to try to diversify how history is taught in Oregon. This is my daughter. Hi, everyone. I'm Zadie Schaefer. Uh, I graduated Lincoln about a year and a half ago, so class of 21. Uh, and now I'm currently a sophomore at Stanford. I'm recording from my dorm room right now. So we're giving a talk today on notable women of Portland, of old Portland. We're focusing on that part of the history. We don't do anything contemporary um, in this talk. We're going very fast. We're going to give you resources for you to study later. And these are a collection of women, uh, so many of which don't have a, a history in what is called old Portland, which is from the river to the hills. Um, but uh, the, you, you can certainly explore those later. So uh, in our book, we talk about Native American pioneer women, progressive era women, women of World War I and World War II, post to contemporary women, as well as women in the arts, women in politics. And we'll be giving you a snippet of those women here today. So the first uh, women that we talk about in uh, what is now Portland were here for approximately 10,000 years. And they were the uh, Chinook speaking people, the Noma, the uh, Clackamas and the Cascades or the Watlata. Uh, there were also uh, people from the Kalapuya tribe, and that were, that was mostly the Tualatin band of the Kalapuya that the Tualatin Mountains were named after, and uh, we call those the West Hills. So Charlotte Terwilliger was a part of an early uh, pioneer family. She came across the Oregon Trail. The Oregon Trail was quite dangerous. Many people were orphaned along the way. She lost her mother on the Oregon Trail when she was three years old. And her father started one of the earliest donation land claims in what is now Portland. What's fascinating to me is that when she grew up, she did what a lot of early Portland women did, which was to join social justice groups like the Pioneers Association and the Sacagawea Statue Association. They worked on uh, women's right to vote. They worked on helping orphans um, uh, from the many orphanages that were where people were made orphaned along the trail. But she also grew up near Native uh, children and they were her only playmates were native children and her brother writes in an oral history about watching native folks uh, go to sweat lodges and then jump into the Willamette River to cool off afterwards so just because the pioneers arrived didn't erase native history this is a very important image for Portland history uh, the black and white image is a basket a Chinook Wasco basket um, collected by Lewis and Clark in 1805. Uh, and Pat Courtney Gold is a, an incredible artist. Uh, Chinook Wasco raised at Warm Springs Reservation. And the, the weaving traditions were being lost. And she went to P the Harvard Peabody Museum and said, can I see this Wasco basket? I'm Wasco. And then the, the basket, um, the color uh, image of the basket is her homage to the 1805 basket. Both baskets are owned by Harvard Peabody Museum. And this history is very important to um, Portland and to Oregon. So Sacagawea was an, an icon for the suffrage movement. Uh, the women in the suffrage movement are depicted here in 1905 at the Lewis and Clark Expo where they unveiled the statue. They used Sacagawea, the statues now at Washington Park, as an icon to remind people that she voted while on the Lewis and Clark expedition and um, uh, yet did not shirk her home responsibilities. This was propaganda that was used to argue that women shouldn't have the right to vote. And she did everything Lewis and Clark did with a baby on her back, cooking, cleaning, sewing, guiding, and translating. And so it's really important that the women of Oregon used Sacagawea as an incredibly important um, icon for women's rights. And they were pretty successful as well because uh, this expo was in 1905 and by 1912, Oregon became the ninth state to give women the right to vote. And this was even before a national legislature that gave um, women all across the US uh, the right to vote regardless of states' rights with the 19th Amendment. So we are gonna talk about a few women now just to give you an idea of um, the impact that they had and the legacy that they hold. This is Lola Green Baldwin, 
Uh, and she was one of, if not the first police woman in the United States. Uh, and she largely did work um, around big expos protecting women. For instance, the 1905 Lewis and Clark Expo we just talked about was uh, a big place for her to kind of uh, debut herself as a policewoman. And she mostly focused on protecting women from men who would, uh, you know, do bad things to them. And she also taught them self-defense uh, as a way to protect themselves from people who would want to do them harm. And next is Mary Geisen Leonard, who was the first uh, woman lawyer in Oregon. Uh, and she primarily focused her work on teaching other women um, how to be lawyers and how to gain the confidence to uh, navigate their way through the system as women in a time where women weren't accepted in jobs like that. Uh, but she did have quite the colorful history. She actually was accused of murdering her husband, uh, but she was acquitted and actually inherited his entire estate. So she's got quite the uh, double-sided coin to her. And she's the reason that women have the right to be lawyers in the state of Oregon. And this is Grace Phelps. She was a nurse and she worked for the Red Cross in many countries across Europe during World War I. And she was also um, the head nurse at uh, Lin what is now known as Linfield College in Portland. So during World War II, um, the women's labor was needed in the, in the workforce because a lot of the men were off at war. And so the propaganda was, can you use an electric mixer? Well, you can learn to operate a drill. And they, uh, the effort was to try to get women into the war industries working in the hard, gritty jobs that were once considered men's labor. And the war industry were shipyards that were all along the Willamette River and the Columbia River. And this woman decided to join the war effort when she was 20, when, when her 27 year old son was reported missing in the Philippines. And it completely changed how women worked in the workforce. And this is a newsletter that was put out by Kaiser Shipyards convincing women to be proud of their uh, labor in the shipyards. But of course, all of it wasn't um, uh, the, the ship, the war industry was segregated. Um, it would, and then President Roosevelt signed an executive order that forbid discrimination based upon race, creed, color, or national origin and defense industries. And that also changed the work industries overnight. This is Nenny May Locke. She's pictured at Giles Lake War Housing in Northwest Portland. And she's part of the African-American uh, women's workforce who came into the war industry. So this is Catherine Hall Bogle, and she was um, the first African-American journalist to write for the Oregonian to get paid for her work. Um, and she was also an avid um, fighter for this cultural and uh, communal landmark of the African-American community in Portland at the time called Golden West Hotel. Um, and so she did a lot of work um, for advocacy in that way for the Portland community. And Dr. Maria Kui was very important an LB, LGBT history in Oregon, um, although she wouldn't have uh, been uh, identified in that way. Uh, in her era, she was uh, thought of as living in a Boston marriage, which was the way society referred to two gals who lived together for many years. Um, she was a doctor who served, uh, helped with reproductive health for low income spent a night in jail with Dr. Margaret Sanger. She took the pamphlet that Dr. Margaret Sanger wrote to teach people how to control their reproductive cycle at a time where that was illegal and she rewrote it to make it more accurate. Um, she spent uh, almost a year in San Quentin jail for um, uh, protesting against the American government and she lived in Goose Hollow. So yeah, um, if you would like to learn more information about this, uh, we've got all these, um, you know, links for different social media sites online to learn more about these uh, pieces of information. This is a pretty short lecture, so uh, this isn't nearly the full the full history. And right. uh, thank you, thank you for listening. Thanks. Take care.